funded, so they're not trying to make money out of you in any way. They again have a huge amount of information, different events on how you can do stuff. So I think the, the biggest piece of advice from my side would be there's just so much free stuff out there. The government are willingly trying to help you find ways to set up your own businesses. So there's so many things that you can do without having to pay a penny to someone. It's just about spending a little bit of time and, and learning. And then also when we get start to get to funding, um, there's also, believe it or not, the big issue, which is you know where you see the homeless people selling that magazine, they also have their own venture catalyst website, which is where they're trying to look for social enterprises that they want to fund. So to try to find people that are looking for, I think, between one and 20,000 pounds, if you needed some money, they actually have their own vehicle where they're trying to invest in micro enterprises. So if you have some element of social uh, factor to what you're doing, that could be a really interesting point of contact as well. So those are just a few quick things. I know that some people in the room are interested in how do I set a business up, so maybe they're helpful resources. Um, the next bit is just my experience from two years in, in World Remit, two and a half years in World Remit. So I mentioned to you about Dr. Ismail Ahmed and how we built our model. When I joined World Remit, um, we were a really shambolic organisation in terms of our marketing approach. So we kind of knew that we were targeting different migrant communities, but we were doing it in a very, very kind of shotgun way, just firing stuff all, all the and one of the reasons why they brought me in actually was to try to build a brand platform and then scale that out. So I just applied normal, let's say, commercial marketing, <coughs> best in class approach, and then applied that to the communities we were working with. And I think that's one of my observations and, and insight from my side is, you may have noticed I'm not a black Nigerian woman, if you haven't. <laughs> but I don't think that's particularly important. What's more important is, are you go, do you have an insight on whoever you're speaking to? Are you somehow finding the, the tension points and the pressure points that are relevant to that community? And are you then interacting pe with people in the right way? Mm -hmm. And I think if you have that understanding, it doesn't really matter whether you're selling biscuits to a seven-year-old or life insurance to a 55-year-old American. It's, for me personally, it's an irrelevance. I think what's more important is do you understand whom you're talking to and what are the drivers for that person that makes your value proposition work. So just a few bits of advice from my side because we were spending a lot of money, I'm talking about millions of pounds in total on, on marketing, and I would get approached by a very, very broad church of activities, and you know, literally churches, um, different um, community groups. We were particularly focused on the biggest countries were Philippines, and then most of the rest were Africa. So we're talking Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, um, Zimbabwe, South Africa to some degree, and, uh, and Kenya obviously is a massive, massive market, and going into Ethiopia and, and Somaliland as well. So there are a few things I could just say about what I would recommend. So for those of you that already have more, this is more for people that have a social enterprise, but I think even if you're looking for an investor in your company, so let's say you decided you wanted to get some money for your, for your business, um, here are a few things I think you can think about. Firstly, have a really clear proposition. It's very, very important. If you can't articulate in a couple of sentences what your business is or your idea or, or your event, then why should anyone give you anything in, in any context, really? Um, have a clear plan in the next step, so actually understand if you're going to start interacting with people and you want money from them in whatever reason, you need to be able to, to understand what that next step is. If I say, okay, here's my five grand, well, and what, what, what happens next? Um, provide some transparent pricing and costs. Be realistic, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. Be pragmatic, um, and try to tie whatever it is you want to the company you're targeting. So here's just some examples. You know, if, we, if we talk about Faustina, how are we doing for time? Have I got five minutes? or? You, I thought you were giving me a wave. Um, so if you, if you look at this event, for example, what would have a clear proposition is um, on the 21st of July, we're running an event where women of colour will have a chance to build their uh, commercial understanding and we're looking for sponsors. That's quite clear and understood, isn't it? I mean, we, we can all understand that. Have a clear plan and a and next step. So, for example, in the attached PDF, um, you can see more about it, including location, number of attendees and opportunities for sponsorship. So you're actually showing someone what it might be like. Provide pricing and costs. So for example, we have XX sponsorship opportunities. Um, you can do X, Y, and Z at the venue uh, to build your brand. Here's an example from last year, if you've done it before, or this is an example of a similar event we're looking to do. Um, be realistic. Um, so you know, try to have an understanding. If you're asking for 20,000 pounds to do you know, something, then that's obviously insane if, you, if it's a small event. So be realistic in that. Um, be pragmatic. So what you might find is when you talk to a business and you're looking for investment or a sponsorship, 
they don't necessarily want to do what you're offering, but then if you're prepared to be, to say, okay, well, what is it you're looking to do? And if they said, for example, well, we would love to actually sign um, Nigerian brand ambassadors up. And you said, oh, okay, well, actually, one thing you could do is X, Y, Z. So then you would be able to, to be pragmatic and slightly adapt what you're offering. Um, and then also to, to make it relevant. So for example, here I said, um, we know that you're working, for example, with migrant communities. We think this would be a really good door opener because many of the people coming to our event are from XYZ communities, whatever it might be. That would be a great entry point if we use that metaphor. And some of the don'ts, they're almost the inverted uh, ones of the do's, but being very vague, and I've got a couple of examples, expect a sponsor to pay for your event, because I think there's a delta between sponsoring and paying for, and my experience at World Admit is there's often a disconnect in expectations between what a sponsor can do or, or will do um, and, what, and what people want. Be emotional or personalise things. Um, difficult when it, your heart and soul is into that, that idea. Um, forget, don't forget it's a sponsorship. They're not there to underwrite you. They're not your mum and dad or something like that. So, you know, think, think about that. Um, or to be unprofessional. And I've got, I've got, these are almost, I've kind of deliberately uh, adapted them a bit, but I've experienced all of these things in um, having to sponsor events for the last couple of years. So in terms of being vague, um, if this would be, for example, I gave you how Faustina could have written to me, but then the bad way would have be, oh, yeah, we've got an event about women being a success who want sponsors. And what, like, so, so what is it like? What, what, what's what's the hook for me? Where, why would I give money to that event? What, what's the what's the purpose of me sponsoring it? Um, don't expect a sponsor to pay for your event. I used to get this a lot where people would say at the last minute, um, if you don't support this event, it won't go ahead, and this will be a, a tragedy for the insert X community. And I'm like, really trying to put a lot of pressure on to me. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not sponsoring it because you've got a gun to my head. I'm not here to sponsor, just to give out to, to pay for things. I work for a business that's, that's profitable or trying to be profitable. I can't just give out money. And another misunderstanding is the bigger the company you're trying to interact with, the longer the planning process is. So I would sometimes get brilliant events, but they would come up at the last minute and they would say, this Friday we're having a celebrating Ghana at 60 event with the ambassador of where Sierra Leone and Ghana, where they're coming. We, need, uh, we urgently need 5,000 pounds. I'm like, guys, are you kidding? I can't, I've got to go to finance director and I've already committed those funds for the, for the next half of the year. So the bigger the company you're talking to, the longer you have to plan ahead. You don't need to give them everything. So you might, and, and also remember yearly planning cycles. Most businesses go on a January, December budgeting. So if you approach them in September, good luck getting money because most budgets have been cut anyway. So the best thing to do is to go in October, September the year before and say, in 2019, I'm going to be running the Reading Afrofest, for example, um, something like this, or the Kenya in the Park for, um, for Scotland or something like that. I would love to get some funding. How would I start talking to you about it and when? That's a really good way to understand how their budget is and, and what they might do, and then start understanding in that way. And then this is something that I would get sometimes as well, which I would just I say to, um, is, is, is to be emotional, but emotional or personalised. So someone would say, like, I'm disgusted that you will only give us £1,000 or something this event is an insult. And, and people have this idea, some of they'll say things like, um, you guys are sending all this money, you're making millions, you, you don't do anything to support It's like, hold on a minute, you know, like, we, we weren't set up as a funding vehicle for migrant yeah. events, that's not what it is. We are working, we want to advertise and sponsor, but it's a communication channel, just like, for example, ITV or Channel 4 sponsoring a football shirt or whatever. It's an, an opportunity for a profit-making entity or a profit-making uh, seeking business to interact with their consumers, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and this way, I would often just have like a really, I would be very respectful to the fact that someone has put their heart and soul into something, but the red light starts flashing for me. If someone is saying that, because it means that I'm worried about their state of mind, I'm thinking, are they actually doing this in a professional way? Or are they trying, you know, this is about them rather than about the community. And sometimes I get threatening things, so like, you know, I, I sponsor a lot of Ghanaian events and I get a new proposed came in ways letter. Really sorry, we've already spent our money. It's like, oh, I'm well connected in the Ghanaian community, I'm going to destroy you guys. Like someone <laughs> oh my God. And, and I would just be like, you know what? As soon as you've done that, you've immediately not only have you been rude to show, but you've put my back up now and I'm just, I'm not prepared to interact with someone that's, that's taking that mentality because what you do is basically uh, it's an emotional hijacking. Isn't it? So, and don't forget it's a sponsorship. So, um, you know, this is where you're trying to get sponsors to support you for something. So it's meant to be people are giving you money for free for something, to do something. 
um, and don't forget that. So don't fall into that trap. If someone would say to me, um, oh, we, we need all this money, and otherwise it, it, we don't have the funding for this, I'd be like, well, that sounds like you haven't got a very good event. You know, mm -hmm. if you have an event that will only survive if I give you X thousand pounds, that, that makes me a bit scared. And then being unprofessional, I mean, I fully understood, and I would give a lot, I, if I was working at Carlsberg, for example, I would have very, very high expectations of our corporate sponsors who we were working with, of course, because they were normally Liverpool Football Club or the European Championship, whatever, so I'd be busting their balls if they weren't doing something right. I, of course, be very, very tolerant. If I understand, for example, let's use Ms. Ghana UK. Two ladies trying to organise for the Ghanaian community some events in North London, They've both got full-time jobs, and I fully understand that they don't answer me within three hours and do, you know, beautiful PowerPoint presentations. That's absolutely fine. Um, so there's an understanding and, and tolerance to the amount of time and energy people can put in. But if you, if someone's asked you for five thousand pounds, and then you've said, okay, what are the next steps, or can you give me the information on where it's going to be and when it's going to happen, and then you don't get an answer for two weeks, then I immediately say, well, okay, I'm not going to give money to that because this person is asking for a lot of money and then they're not giving me information mm -hmm. on it. And then you would find sometimes literally a week before the event to say, please send me the money urgently now because we need to, to do this. Like, sorry guys, like, I've got a finance director here. I can't just, you know, there isn't £5,000 I just take out and start throwing them around. Because I'm, I'm, I'm accountable to that money. We've got a compliance department. We've got, you know, very, very strict rules. So that's one of the things that I would say is to be really mindful of is if you're going to ask for money, like in anything really, make sure there's a quick follow-up and it's a professional one. So and even if you don't know, acknowledge and quickly engage and say, great that you, you're interested in a sponsor, there's actually going to be a three-week delay while we finalise the venue. Rather than we give you um, not sufficient information now, this is what I can give you now, and then I can come back to you on this date. That's a really professional way to do it. And a great example I can give you is there's a lady called Acostia Annabelle from the Tech in Ghana event. You can have a look at this one. And I started working with her a couple of years ago, and it was when she just started. And it was a really, really good event. Um, but we were nervous. She'd never done the event before. It's the first time. So I was, I'm always very apprehensive to give money to a new event because there's no proof of concept. And a lot of people, it, let's say, um, it inflates slightly the numbers. You know, so like, there'll be 10,000 Nigerians there or whatever. And, it's like, they, and you get there, there's like 20 people and, then, oh. and 10 of them are children. You're like, okay. Uh, so, I, so, like, but, so I said, we're not, we're not going to give you a major investment that we're prepared to do X, Y, and Z. We did it, it was a brilliant event, and then she said, I'm going to do it in Ghana now. So we said, okay, same logic applies, let's see proof of concept. This one. But then this year, we kind of quadrupled the amount of money we spent with her because we could see that it was a really, really good event, both in Accra and also here in London. So I think it's about, you know, it's winning people's trust, isn't it, about getting a proof of concept and doing it. Better to do a smaller event brilliantly than to do a big event that has 101 things going wrong and then you, you upset everyone involved. So that was just like, I mean, it's a very broad bit of advice. I hope it was helpful to some degree, but uh, hopefully I was in time for you as well. I have a question. Please. The question is personal. I want to know how did I do? How did people <laughs> have to know they approached you? Yeah, it's great. And actually, that was a good example from this year. So um, one of the things which Fasina did was, I mean, I won't talk about the numbers at all to, to protect intellectual uh, secrecy and so on. But what I say is Fasina has approached us to, to sponsor Leaves of Colour last year, 2017, was it? 2017. Yeah, 2017. So that's when we started working with her and that was one of the first events we did. Um, and then this year she approached us again and actually we had a bit of a budget cut in some areas. So it was, and it was a great example of what Fasina could have done is like, you bastards, you, you know, you're trying to milk me and screw me, I've done this, this and this. How dare you? Do you not know how hard I work on these things? But actually, she didn't do that. You know, I was. We were never. We weren't playing any games or anything. So in reality, this is the budget we've got. And then she, so she came back to it, being pragmatic and said, "Okay, I understand. I will probably have to get another sponsor involved that might be somehow competitive or something like this. It means I won't be able to give you as much visibility on the day." Um, but if you could increase by this much, we might be able to do this. And then we found the middle ground and said, okay, yeah, I could probably pay a little bit more for this and this would be the, the best way forward. Because it wasn't me trying to say, how can I get as much exposure free from leaves of colour? And maybe there will be people like that, but certainly from how I would work, that wouldn't be the approach. And I think that because I've seen demonstrated a pragmatism to say, okay, I understand that that's your budget, I'll probably have to get other sponsors. We weren't, you know, that she didn't say the event's now dead. Bastard, you know, something like that. So uh, you know, that was a really important part of then building that relationship, and I think it's all relative to to that hook and, and what is relevant for it.
Well, I don't work for World Remit now, um, but I would say the answer is no. What we generally would do when I was working at World Remit was we were specifically focused on um, reach and engagement. So our primary reason for going in, so we would sponsor everything, we sell our, like going into Ugandan churches, uh, Nigerian churches, different uh, different events, whether it's Kenya in the park, whether we're sponsoring Miss Ghana UK, celebrating Ghana at 60. We would do these events where there's mass participation of a large group of people that were relevant to a country that was sending money home. And that's a great way because the, the fundamental reason is World Remit is not a very well-known brand, so it's really important for us to be visible in that community mm -hmm. so we can actually then interact with people. And when you talk about something like uh, uh, what you're doing in terms of like academic research, it's we're not big enough yet, we're not, we're not actually profitable, World Remit isn't, so it's there to actually try and eventually become profitable. So we'd be looking for mass engagement events rather than for example, a, comp a bigger corporate company. So I've seen like Tallow Oil and other like MTN and things. They often do things because they're already big profitable businesses where they're looking to show that they're a good company. Whereas what we're trying to do is just say we're a company. We're at an earlier stage of development. You see what I mean? Are there companies like Woolworths? Oh, there are definitely because if, and if you look at who is often sponsoring, so a good way is to look at Chamber of Commerce and things like that. So there'll be the Ghanaian Chamber of Commerce, the Nigerian one, and if you look at the kind of companies that are sponsoring that, they will often have some money allocated towards supporting people from those communities as well, or they would be more open to in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we started Vivas of Color in two thousand and fourteen, we had um, uh, L'Oreal. Mm -hmm. Contacted us by themselves, yeah. You know, and they asked few questions, and we just you know, sent other things that they asked for and everything. And then what they said was they are going to be watching us, you know, because it's still a new event. Yeah. So in that case, if if you were in my shoe, what would you do? To I would definitely follow up. I would, without question, I would follow up, and I'd probably mm -hmm. I'd actually hit the phones first. I would like time because it's not very popular these days. These days, do it. Um, I hate getting phone calls, cold phone calls, but you could just phone up uh, the, or you could contact their corporate PR saying that I'm from this organisation, show the fact that you've had MPs there and so on in the past at your events, and then say, um, we were in earlier discussions with you at L'Oreal, and we were, we were interested to now pick that up, who would be the relevant person to address it to, and then take it from there, because I think it's, uh, there's definitely something in it, and if I, I can understand why there would be risk averse. So again, the bigger the company, there's bigger amounts of money, but there's higher amounts of risk for that person as well. So imagine if you work at, I mean, World Remit, we're in charge of like sending money, and it's like a very important, serious category. And we also have banking licenses that are really high risk for us. So let's say I sponsor Kenya in the park, and then there's suddenly on page two, three, and four of Metro or something, it's like 400 drunk Kenyans in mass brawl in West Ham Park. <laughs> That's not what you want in a world from it, man in background. So oh, yeah. then, you, then you're like, whoa. You know, so there's obviously an element of risk, and you, you can't negate it, but you can mitigate it by looking at previous events. So that's something that I would always try to do, and I'd always say to the people in my team that would support me on sponsoring events is do a bit of desk research. So find out that person, if it says, like, you know, like Faustina when you um, out of jail after triple murder or something, like, mm, where do I want to be sponsoring her? Yeah. Yeah. So that, would be, that would be kind of branding, isn't it? Like, yeah. um, sometimes brands look at the, how you're positioning your brand for them. Yeah, to yeah, for sure. Not just numbers, but that sometimes as well. Absolutely right, yeah. So it's to do with, and often, what, one thing that's important for someone that has an event is you should be thinking about, you're often thinking about your event, which is completely understandable, but when you want sponsors, you're effectively getting money for something, you then need to think about what is it that, what is it that they want to show, and be very pragmatic and commercial about it, because that's the brutal, you're now selling something for money, so you've got to be, just like if you're selling a coffee, if they're selling it 10p cheaper next door, you've got to think about that. So if you're contacting L'Oreal, you've got to think, okay, big BMOF company, they want to try to say, you're a black woman, and I sell products that are good for you, not only the white teeth over here, that kind of thing. That's a brutal reality of what they're trying to say. Yeah, that, that's why they want to sponsor it. So then you've got to find a way, a hook to go into them to say, um, I know how important it is for you to represent and to engage with four million women of colour in the United Kingdom. I just invented these numbers, I'm just saying. Um, that's why this is one of the events we're doing, which has a reach within our community of, boom. We've got, you know, one million views on our videos on, on YouTube, 
of which um, we believe around 80 to 85% are of the Nigerian or community, whatever it might be. That's suddenly a hook because immediately if I'm a marketing person, mm. I'm like, oh, okay, so there's a context, there's a relevance, there's a, a target audience there. And then if you say, we'd be really open-minded for you guys, if you have a message for our community and you want to talk to us about products that could be relevant in a way that would be relevant, we'd love to talk to you about it. That way it's kind of, a, it's a, instead of just saying, we have an event in two months and we need a thousand pounds, you know, whatever it might be. There's a, it's, it's the same, you're getting the same thing. Um, and a good analogy I said to someone the other day, I don't know if you find it good in this room or not, but if any of you have seen A Beautiful Mind, it's a film with Russell Crowe. Mm, yeah. He's a bit crazy. And at the moment he goes up to the bar and he says something like, I can't remember exactly because I'm not going to remember probably, but this may be, we, we both know that we're going to go home and I have sex. So that why don't we just, instead of me buying you the drinks, why don't we just go now? And she yeah. like slaps yeah. him or whatever. Yeah. Because uh, Paul's fundamentally he under, misunderstood that that buying a drink and a talking is the really <laughs> important thing. So you, know, you can't just seal the deal at the end. So it's the same thing. Um, your details, you've mentioned that you've got your own company yeah. that started you two months ago. Yeah. Are you looking for clients? Um, yes, I am. I mean, at the moment, I'm just starting doing that business development and all that sort okay. of stuff. And do there have to be UK based clients only? Well, funny enough, to, I've just got three clients now. One of them is one that's based in London, and the other one is based in Switzerland. And the other one is uh, based, actually, he's an American guy who's just moved to the UK, so it's Anglo American in that way. Oh, okay. A quick one, please, before we stop. Yes, you can. Can we state money amount? Say again, or do sorry. we just, can we state, when we approach them with a proposal, can we say, oh, we want 5,000, or should we just say support us? Yeah, so a great example here, and this is where sometimes people get angry, but I had a very good context of what a value was, because I was sponsoring every community, so I understood, and this is just commercial, it's a reality, so at World Remit, if we're sponsoring a Nigerian event, and we can interact with 5,000 Nigerians at a, in a park in London, for example, mm -hmm. and the cost is 2,000 pounds, and then someone comes in and says, I have an event for Sierra Leoneans and it's going to be um, £20,000 sponsorship, whatever. Like, like, so I, I would just go back to them and say, look, I'm interested in your event, it looks great, but we just can't afford £20,000 mm -hmm. because we, we know that we're sponsoring other communities at lower price. And I'm not hardballing, it's just a reality. Mm -hmm. It's a commercial decision. So I think as long as you're pragmatic, I think you can go with a fair value, but you have to be quite honest and transparent, but then also say, if this isn't within your expectations, we can do X, Y, Z. I think that's the best way to approach it. And it's very pricing some of these things. I think the challenge, especially when you're talking about migrant communities, is to what degree is a, what is a fair price? It is a little bit hard. It's easier if you're just going on ITV or something like that because it's a mass audience. But you've got to think about what's relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's still much to talk about. But.